Let's next take a look at service options. Again, this is where all of our server applications and OS services are going to reside within the policy. So you'll notice when I first expand service options, under general service options, again, you're going to see resource lists, network controls, some of those repeating capabilities. Now, if I wanted to say something was writable to any server application and or any OS service on this machine under general I could come down to resource lists and writable and define either a path or to a directory or to an individual file or to a registry key and say allow but maybe log modifications now what this is going to do is if I under global have said this particular path was uh, had no access capabilities then I've essentially just created a whitelist saying that any server application or OS service can now go touch this file. An interactive program would still be blocked from touching that particular file. I could do the same thing under network controls as well. You can also see that we have the same option here for disabling prevention. If I wanted to get a little more comfortable with the prevention capabilities I could turn on prevention a little bit at a time. So maybe I want prevention to run on my interactive program options but nothing under server under my service options I could uncheck globally disable prevention up at the top which we did earlier at the beginning of the training and just turn this piece on now only things under interactive program options would actually be um, applied to the prevention policy Let's take a few, let's take a look at some of the other options here under general. The biggest one to point out under service options and general service options is the selection for alternate privilege lists. From here we can specify, the first option is here, um, specify services that should not start. So we can basically say these services that I add to this list have no privileges. An important thing to point out is when I come down here and click add, I can give it the program path but I can also assign a username and a group name. These can be active directory names and groups. So I can give privileges to certain users and certain groups of users to what application they can open and what they can do with that particular application. Now you'll also see the concept of full and safe. A full service or a full application means that it has the ability to touch anything on this asset, no matter what we have said should be blocked, even at the global level. This, this can be assigned to things like your backup programs, your antivirus applications, third-party deployment tools, but the catch is anything under full also has the ability to, manip to manipulate the CSP agent, including shutting down the CSP agent. So where we typically see customers define, um, again, those software distribution tools and backup solutions, things of that nature, is under safe privileges. And this has the same capabilities as full, but it does not override the self-preservation technology built into critical system protection. You can see you can define services and service modules under here, all under alternate privilege lists. Let's take a look at some of the other sections. So let's say we wanted to go take a look at a few applications. So Microsoft Exchange, IIS, and Microsoft SQL Server are the three, the three Windows applications, server apps, that we profile out of the box. These applications are chosen based on the Internet Security Threat Report. For Windows, these are the three most commonly attacked applications. Now, if your customer has other applications they're using, and certainly they, they do, um, in a later part we will show you how to create a custom program so basically be able to add other applications to this list it's a very simple process but let's say that um, we have globally said that no no one should have access to the exchange data store globally no one has, should have access to the exchange data store well since we have exchange here we can go and expand on the options. We can go to advanced options and now again you see the resource lists and the network controls. If we wanted to say that no one except Exchange has the ability to go touch the Exchange data store, we can come under here to resource lists, 
writable resource. And we can say, maybe we don't care about modifications. We just want to allow everything. We don't want to log it. Turn that, turn that feature on, go to list, and now we can add the path to the Exchange data store. What we have now essentially done is enable that only the Exchange service and services that Exchange executes can have a, the ability to go touch that particular data store. And keep in mind, if we've identified an application as full or safe, those applications can also go touch that Exchange data store as well. So great to have, again, your backup solution there, your antivirus solution as well. Same thing applies to network controls. You see network controls here. We can go and create, again, we can use our components in our lists, or we can actually write an actual network rule. And again, anything that we put here, if we open up a particular port or allow a particular IP address, this is only going to apply to Microsoft Exchange. So I mentioned that the service options also cover our OS services. So to take a look at those, we simply select Core OS Service Options, and now here's all of the OS services that we have profiled out of the box. And again, you could select any of these and drill down and put additional constraints around them by selecting Advanced Options. And again, you see Disable Prevention, Resource Lists, Network Controls, things of that nature. A few other things to point out from these screens is we also have the ability uh, for buffer overflow detection. This is going to detect a buffer overflow and then block the payload from actually um, executing on the particular machine. We also have enabling thread injection detection. This is going to look at applications basically trying to invade the memory space of other applications all running on the same asset. I already mentioned the concept of a full or safe application or service, but you'll notice there's also custom and default. Custom we'll discuss in another part of this training, but that essentially allows you to define an application or service and tell us the exact constraints you want to place around that particular application or service. And again, they're very simple to set up. Default is where basically everything else falls. If the application or service isn't explicitly called out by Symantec, isn't listed as a full, safe, or custom application, then it falls under the default category. And this basically um, applies a default set of constraints around the application. One of the reasons that this is so useful is if you apply this policy in January, and two or three months later, um, after you've already applied this policy and maybe you ha you're not monitoring it, you're not going back out and checking it every once in a while, someone comes in and installs another application, maybe a brand new application that Symantec has never seen and that your customer has never seen. As soon as that application starts up, whether it be a legitimate server application or a worm or a Trojan or a peer-to-peer -peer application, we are going to recognize that application automatically as it's starting up and automatically place some default constraints around it. What this will do is apply buffer overflow protection, memory injection protection. It's also going to do things like prevent it from modifying the executable of the executables of other applications running on your machine. It's basically going to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the other operations already taking place on the machine. And it's also going to prevent other applications from interfering with this new application as well. And lastly, we have interactive program options. So again, by looking at the general interactive program options, you'll see a lot of the same, same capabilities we saw under global and we saw under service options as well, with one addition, CSP agent tools. Under CSP Agent Tools, you'll see the ability to allow all users um, or specific users or groups of users um, to access the CSP Configuration Tool. So this, this includes things like the Command Line Tool. Um, this is a very powerful tool. Um, this allows you to disable prevention, apply different policies, change the agent communication port, things of that nature. Um, so typically only your administrative users should have access to this tool. Below that, you see the SCSP Agent Event Viewer. 
This gives local users or specifically local admins the ability to on Windows machines monitor his or her events generated on that machine. This is a GUI that will uh, that can be opened by the end user and um, again will display the um, activities and events that the CSP agent has generated on just that machine. So if they don't have privileges into the actual CSP console, it's a good way to let them see what's actually taking place on their local machine. If we go in under specific interactive program options, here you'll see we have Outlook and Outlook Express, we have Microsoft Office, uh, we also have Internet Explorer. So let's go take a look at one of the examples here, Internet Explorer. So we'll look at Internet Explorer, Basic Options, and you'll see Disable Execution of Specific Programs. So if there's certain executables you don't want Internet Explorer to be able to execute, we can do that through this command right here. We already, um, out of the box, we already disallow, as you can see, um, a command shell to be executed from within Internet Explorer. Other applications can be added to this list, and you can see we also have the ability to specify username or group names to go along with that. So we can give different privileges based on the user ID or the group ID that's logged into the particular machine. So as you can see, there's a lot of flexibility within critical system protection, a lot of use cases, a lot of different scenarios for implementing this product and positioning this product that we'll go over in future parts of this training.